Hello, and welcome to Banking Transform Solutions, a new podcast that provides financial institutions insight into marketplace solutions that can help organizations through their digital banking transformation. I'm your host, Jim Maroos, founder and CEO of the Digital Bank Report and co-publisher of the financial brand. Banks and credit unions are rethinking their distribution strategies as more people than ever are using digital channels. Despite the shift, closing all branches is not necessarily the best alternative. Forward-thinking banks are adopting alternative models, including self-service banking that is complemented with new technology in a lean branch format. Organizations are also considering pop-up branches and shared facility alternatives, as well as very unique ways to reach the consumer during this pandemic and after. Today's guest is Mike Aldrich, International Head of Sales for Auriga. We're going to discuss how bank branches may not be dead, but definitely need to be rethought as organizations try to improve service to customers at a lower cost. Welcome to the show today, Mark. Good to see you. Nice to be here, Jim. Thanks for having me. Great to be part of the new podcast. So before we start, I want to thank you and Auriga for agreeing to be our first interview as part of the Banking Transform Solutions podcast. Our goal is to provide a new format that will discuss innovative ways that financial institutions globally can partner with market leaders to support their digital banking transformation. I wonder if you could share a bit of background on Auriga for those in our audience who may not be familiar with your organization. Sure, of course I will, Jim. Auriga is uh, originally a European organization. We've now got customers on four continents, over 30 countries, and we're just about to celebrate our 29th anniversary. Um, we're a leader in, in what we term omni-channel, and what that means to us is integrating the digital channels of a bank so that uh, customer-operated devices can be used to provide a common user experience, a personalized journey, and give great customer service. So the entire industry is well aware of the many branch closings that occurred worldwide as part of the pandemic. Many branches are still closed or are being used on a modified basis as we continue to fight the impact of COVID. Knowing that branches will not remain closed forever, what impacts have you seen globally and how have organizations pivoted to serve the consumers who relied previously on physical banking, but maybe have gotten more used to digital options? Well, I think firstly, um, branch closings, branch closures uh, are, are a feature that was, they predate the COVID pandemic. And so I, I think what banks have sought to do is to read the COVID behavior, the behavior during the pandemic as a continuation of a trend that had already started and interpret it as a permanent trend. And, and that's where I think I would differ with banks, where other industries are working really hard to get support in order to retain retail premises to, to keep their outlets open, whatever their industry. Banks seem to have seized the opportunity to interpret this temporary behavior as permanent uh, and to debranch, to reduce their costs, to reduce the access to financial services to their customers. So that's, that's a bad thing. Uh, of course, most legacy banks, most banks have alternative channels and they're asking their customers to rely on them. And when they are reliable, that's okay. But not all customers favor the same channels. And so we think that uh, coming out of the pandemic, we'd like to see uh, a different approach to branches, not least to the numbers and the, the speed with which branches and ATMs are disappearing. So you mentioned that in, in some cases, banks are, are debranching and, and going rather radical. In the US, it's probably the opposite. We're, we're probably trying to encourage financial institutions to look and say, you know, can you rethink branches? Do you see this, this shift and in, in the way consumers are going to view branches going forward being different on a regional or a countrywide basis? Or is it pretty much uniform, but banks are reacting differently? Maybe you've just uh, told me that bank banks are behaving differently, are reacting differently. I, and, and of course, no behavior is uniform. No behavior is, is constant and, and, and the, the same everywhere. But I do think there are many, many consumers who want to get back into bank branches. I think where the assumption is that that's not the case, that's a, a, an assumption that will be tested. Uh, and I think in those regions that, that where cash is more popular and where different methods of payment are still favored, then absolutely there should be more investment. And we do see investment in branches of different kinds uh, and, and of uh, getting the most out of that estate because we live in an industry, of course, where the legacy banks have the 
both the strength of, of a, a branch estate and an ATM fleet, but also the costs of those. And they're competing with organizations that don't. So it's about finding the balance between exploiting those, those advantages and minimizing those disadvantages. So one of your solutions is something you call the lean bank branch. It's a model of a solution for, but that helps for both banks and consumers. Can you describe a little bit about the difference between a lean branch and what would be considered maybe a traditional branch? Sure, sure. Well, firstly, it can be smaller um, and it can be um, pop-up, it can be mobile, it can be anywhere. Um, it can be 24 hours because the technology allows it. It can provide a full automated service and, and remote access to expertise, which is too expensive to place in every branch. So by lean, we mean low cost, we mean full service, we mean capable of, of popping up anywhere or indeed being mobile. Um, and it's a new model which, which increases revenues by offering more service for more hours of the day, but also reduces costs in terms of real estate, in, in, in terms of human resources. So Lean is, is, we think, a future which is really important, really exciting, and can solve the problems of the legacy banks and potentially address the issues of, of those banks who wish to explore growing a branch estate. So really, it, it's a, a mix of both the digital and physical and, you know, there, it, it, you mentioned that it does help make bank branches more viable and increase profits. So you're, you're both, if I understand it correctly, you're both shrinking the size. So you're, you're, you're lowering your costs overall. You're increasing the, the revenue potential, gives a potential of longer hours and new ways of serving consumers. But probably more importantly, it doesn't put the category of how you distribute in a favorable or unfavorable, it really makes it that the consumer can make that selection. So, you know, we in the States, we have a, a situation where, you know, uh, almost overnight you had to build new ways of opening new accounts, but it, it wasn't done very effectively. And we have account opening times globally that still end up being longer than 10 minutes. Well, we don't want to force consumers into the branch, you know, because of our digital processes being too difficult. But if I'm understanding it correctly, your lean bank branch concept really says we got to work on both sides. It's a behind the scenes movement that says we got to change some of the process that are going to both hope and make it better in the branch, but just importantly, make it better digitally. So what you're doing is you're, if I'm not, and please explain this, you're, you're basically increasing the experience, not just on the branch side, but on the digital side. So it makes it so there's a better choice for the consumer, no matter which way they go, correct? Absolutely right, Jim. It, it, and it is about choice and it is about the consumer. And, and so, of course, banks have to look carefully at their costs. This reduces costs, but they also have to look at their income and this can increase income. We, we've talked about physical and digital. Or you mentioned that in the concept of this branch, it's possible that during the business day, this is an assisted service environment. There is a, a, a branch teller, a, a branch representative carrying technology able to engage with the customer. Now, this is the first time in many years other than over the counter where a bank is engaging directly one to one with his client in a physical way. Every innovation, every new digital channel from telephone banking through internet banking through mobile banking, each of those has, has actually created a physical distance between the bank and its customer. And that challenges loyalty and loyalty is is pretty important when we're in a very competitive environment. And it and it challenges the knowledge that the customer is prepared to share with, with the bank. So this idea that the, the lean branch can have a physical presence plays to that. Overnight, the, the um, remote video assistance can mean that the full service can still be delivered and sub subject matter experts can be, can be used to provide great service. But yeah, it's all about having an effective infrastructure and effective back end. And some of these things are barely possible for some institutions because of the technology choices they've taken in the past. So it's really important to tidy up the infrastructure in order to deliver this new kind of customer experience. Well, I, I think, you know, what's interesting about Ariga is you're not a, I wouldn't say a pro branch company. You know, you're not out there redesigning branches as the major part of your model. Your model really is based on the inner processes and functions that make the delivery channels work. So, again, you're, you're not pushing for branches or against branches. You're saying we've got to make every channel not just more efficient, 
but more effective? Because we haven't done very well in banking notes as we tried to shift, or as you mentioned, you know, from ATMs to mobile banking to online banking. All those things were really not really built for a better customer experience. We, we sold it outside like that. But the re we sold it inside was we want to replace transactions. So it really was an efficiency play and not very good because in each case, we found that what happened was, yeah, you saw some drop off the transactions, but overall, you saw a, a, a huge increase in overall transactions. So it wasn't it wasn't a one to one ratio. People people I go to my phone daily, but I never went to my branch daily to look at my balances. So, you know, when you look at what are the what are the biggest situations when you look at a new branch model? What are the challenges and obstacles you've seen as you go out there and try to meet with financial institutions? What are the hurdles you have to cross to get a financial institution to embrace a completely new, I'm not going to say branch strategy, I'm going to say distribution strategy. Well, the, the first thing is that typically banks aren't built to think this way. They, they, they have built uh, infrastructure in silos. They treat their channels differently. Their branch channel is separate from their self-service channel, from their point of sale channel if they have one. Uh, and indeed, they're digital as, as we call them online channels. So they, they're built to think, to invest, to plan, to buy in, the, in those different ways. So the first challenge is to have them think as a single entity because the customer will choose which of those routes it takes into their, into their financial services, into their, customer, into their relationship with the bank, into their own cash. So they have to think um, in, in a holistic way. They have to think about the customer uh, and they have to think about the infrastructure that they've got behind. So I think the, the biggest challenge is, it's the old saying, you know, if, when you know a town well, if somebody asks you for directions, I wouldn't start from here. This is not the right place for many place, banks to start from. And so the first job is to look at their own structure, the way they think, the way they plan, the way they budget, and, and their technical infrastructure. And most technical infrastructure built over the last 40 years, because the ATM is over 50 years old, the infrastructures that support most of them more than 40 years old and very cash focused. And that's not what self-service and digital and the new branch structures are all about. They're about a whole range of services. They're about a common customer experience. They're about journeys that will go between channels. <clears throat> so look at that infrastructure and where are the quick wins? Where are the ways to change that infrastructure without throwing away everything? Um, you know, there are massive programs around the world for core bank replacement and modernization. There are massive migrations into the cloud, and these are credible and, and right thinking ways, ways of going for banks. But ultimately, they won't have an immediate impact on the customer. And while you're doing that, while you're changing the, uh, moving around the deck chairs, uh, the customer experience is suffering, the customer is, is suffering, and there's a lot of people want those customers from you. So look at your structure, look at the way you think and plan. Think of all channels agnostically. We're an agnostic company. We, we, we deliver independence. We deliver right. um, total choice. And, mm -hmm. and so think about those things and then look, look at infrastructure and make quick, quick wins, uh, easy changes, incremental innovation, some, some people in, in the industry call it. Uh, but let's, let's focus on that kind of behavior. So, so it's interesting. I'm wondering from your perspective, if an organization says, we've got to rethink distribution, do you try to put on, and, and for lack of a better term, your digital banking hat and say, if I fix a process for a good digital experience with speed and simplicity, I then can deploy that same thinking to my online banking experience, and I can deploy that exact same thinking to a better branch experience, because if I make it efficient in a digital mindset, the way the digital consumer wants to engage in a fast, easy, simple way, and I deploy it across the other channels, I'll go backwards, I'll call it backwards in the distribution chain. Um, do we find that that helps the entire distribution model with regard to working with the consumer if they, if they put on how does a digital consumer want to engage and then move it backwards? I, I think it does. And I think we, we have the good fortune of, of, of the, the, the background of our business is one that you know, means that we think that way and we think that consumers think that way. So we, we um, have been involved in the development of online banking solutions, internet banking solutions for the 28 years that we've been in existence. Um, but we took that thinking into self-service and, and that was a little bit left field because the industry doesn't see self-service like that. The industry sees self-service as having to be connected through a certain set of rails using a certain 40-year-old protocol. 
Um, so, so we came from a different place. We, we actually absolutely believe that customers think of the channels differently and, and that'll continue to develop. You know, there are different demographics, different generations hooked on different um, channels and the size and the worth of those demographics is what the banks should be looking at. You know, where is, where is the current demand? Where is the future demand? And maybe there's an obsession with meeting future demand and, and, and dropping the ball on, on current demand. But absolutely, because of the way we started in business, because of the way our infrastructure and our technologies, our architecture was born, you know, we, we think in terms of what, what can we do in, in a single place and do once that will impact all the channels, which will impact all of your customers' experience? Um, because it's, it's really too much housekeeping to have to change everything for everybody uh, a number of times. Let's, let's do it once. Let's make it central. Uh, and let's preserve as much of the back-end infrastructure as we can. But let's bring in something which shares services across all channels, where, where the customer experience is the same, the journey is personalized, the choices are, are made by the customer. Um, and, but centrally, you have a, a view of all that's going on in, in your business. Well, what's interesting too is while we think about how we digitize the processes and make them easier and simpler, we're also trying to see, I believe from your perspective, how do we deploy humans to make the digital process more humanized. So this is not a replacement of people game. There may be some replacement, certainly some redeployment of resources. I mean, people in branches may be deployed in solving other problems that are not interaction in on a face-to-face -face basis. They may be deployed in onboarding solutions, for instance, once a person opens an account. But what's interesting to remember is that you know, consumers don't want digital for the fact of saying it's always got to be simple and easy. There are some people that say, I want simple and easy, but I want to have access to the people. I want to have the humanization of the digital process. I, I kid with a couple of financial institutions I'm familiar with that, you know, they made their, their heyday was during the branch time having the best branch experience. I said, now, how do you make that into a digital experience that people remember? And that's a whole new equation because it's putting humans into the digital process. So as you look around the world, you work with a number of financial institutions. One thing I know that Riga has seen is a lot of brand new, very unique models that are, are, are not widespread. They're, they're test models in some cases, but you've seen things such as pop-up branches and shared facilities. Can you discuss some of the more innovative ways you've seen delivery happening as a result of COVID or even before COVID? Sure, sure. Um, and, and you're right. There, there's a lot of experimentation going on. We, we like to think that we don't deal so much in experimentation, but of deployment and delivery. You know, we, we're delivering experiences to our customers, customers, which are real scalable industrial strength. So, so yeah, sure. There's a lot of institutions have built a lot of showrooms uh, to, to see what is possible. Uh, but we'd like to go one step further and actually deploy and, and, and deliver that. The involvement of humans, the physical interaction, that's really important. It plays to the fact that we've both discussed already that banks are uh, increasing efficiencies and reducing costs, but at the cost of relationship, at the cost of physical contact. So putting people into those branches, equipping them with, with tablets, which tell them the status of every device in the, in the, in the branch, the, the cash that's available, the services that are available, tells them about the customer that stood in front of them. So they can give the same experience to their customers as my grandfather's bank manager used to give him and they were on first name terms. So putting the people back is really vital. And, and our customers find that um, bank staff embrace the opportunity to have different roles, to add more value, to be motivated and trained in different ways. So certainly that, that's, that's the case. The different models, well, we, we work in countries where uh, the, the self-service banking infrastructure is common to every bank, for example. So the only way to differentiate is to, is to go a different way, go it alone, cut your own furrow. And we work with organizations who've implemented 24-hour branches, which are automated entirely through the night, supported by remote video, uh, access to the same services as during the day, but during the day, there's a personal experience. This is assisted service rather than self-service. So the principle of the customer being guided through a process up to and including co-browsing, co-sharing, so that somebody remotely can help them fill in a form to onboard them to, uh, to uh, make a loan application, obviously within the regulatory principles of what uh, the customer needs to maintain control over. So th th there's models like that. 
In the ATM space, it's really common today to either outsource off-premise ATMs or to pool them. So banks worldwide are bringing together their resources and saying, rather than us each have to run our own ATM networks, let's, let's put them together. Let's have a third party run them. Let's maybe neutral brand it. This is a common model, uh, especially in Europe. Um, and, and then we can rationalize how many ATMs we have, because in many countries, there have been too many ATMs in, in the high street but too few in the rural areas. Right. So let's have a model where, where they're pooled, they're shared, and they are within easy reach of all of the consumers. And, and taking that technology and taking it a little st one step further is about pooling branches, about shared branches. And that's where we go with our lean branch, with the technology that we're deploying. If you're sharing ATMs, if you're sharing services of that kind, why not contemplate sharing branches? Um, and in the increasingly open world, that's something which is not only desirable, but unavoidable, but certainly it addresses the costs and efficiency arguments that the banks are, are really confronting. So when you look at shared branches, do you mean shared with other types of organizations in other industries, or do you mean shared branches as in multiple financial institutions using the same branch? Both, both. So many, many of our customers already um, offer their branches out. Real estate is is, is is the albatross around the necks of legacy banks. Um, so many of our of our customers, uh, rather than dispose of the real estate, are subletting it, are making it available for community projects, to small businesses, to others. So a multi-service branch is, is a model which is quite common in a range of a coffee a coffee um, uh, franchise through through to small businesses and, and other advisors. But sharing between banks is also absolutely um, achievable, where the customer is able to get the experience of the brand of the bank that they bank with in a branch which is shared between other branches. The technology is there to allow that. As I said, many banks' infrastructures don't necessarily play to that, but the technology will, will permit multiple banks to share a branch. And this could be legacy banks downsizing their estates. It could be neobanks, uh, fintechs getting into the branch estate business. Uh, it could be uh, independent ATM deployers extending their business model so that instead of just providing ATMs as a service, they can also supply branches as a service. And it really does address certainly the costs and the efficiency challenges of, of banks. It balances, it sort of balances up the difference between legacy banks with branch infrastructure, which they regard as a cost, and neo banks with no branch infrastructure, that, which they regard as a desirable outcome. So either, either shared amongst different kinds of businesses, complementary businesses makes better sense because then you can upsell, cross-sell and, and have real commercial, real commercial marketplace. Uh, but also shared between banks and where where it's the best thing to do for a community because reputationally withdrawing the last bank from from a from a rural community um, does a lot of damage so why not keep a branch share it and, and provide great service to everybody's customers so one of the benefits a riga provides is you obviously see how banking organizations worldwide are dealing with the digital versus branch and all the other back office items that take into account there. So I would imagine that you've never seen a a, a, a data format that's the same. You, you've seen terrible data organizations. You've seen better data organizations. And one of the benefits I would think that Ariga provides is that because you've seen these things, because you've seen how each one of them have to work and and how they have to pivot based on what their corporate objectives are, you can bring these case studies to the to the forefront and say, you know what, I understand what you're saying, but this may be a better model. We've done this here and done this there. How does your technology and how does your experience working with literally hundreds of financial institutions globally help organizations that are just starting down this path? Different ways, different ways. So I think part of the challenge is uh, if there is existing infrastructure which needs we need to integrate with in order to achieve these models. Um, now, the good news is that there are sets of standards across the industry and most organizations have adopted some or all of those standards. We are, of course, compliant, as are other um, providers, with international standards so that it's really easy. It's kind of our, our, our number one day one activity to integrate with existing environments and to integrate with them using the most efficient, the most appropriate protocol, whether that's web services, whether that's an international standard, whether that's something different. 
Uh, so integrating into their existing environment day one, really important. And, and that's something that we do every day and in every project. So as you rightly said, you go around the world and people say it's different here. Well, it is different, but it's fundamentally the same. And the difference, yeah. the differences are at the edges. And, and it's those differences that, that our experience takes us to. So first of all, integrate with, with existing environments, then provide openness for change because the one thing we know for certain is there's going to be new channels that we haven't even thought of yet. There's going to be new products and services and relationships. So we need integration at the back end. We need integration for the future and open integration. Um, and, and then, and then we need to, to start to deploy, um, rapidly. And, and that requires, um, commitment from, from both sides. Um, and it's the kind of commitment we give to our customers every day. Um, and the benefits of that, you know, you're going to get reduced costs, you're going to get increased efficiency, you're going to get better customer experience, increased, we think, revenues, lower risk. Um, and, and it will enable banks to focus on the things that are important to them. So if that's a single product, new, new entrant at bank, it'll allow them to concentrate on bringing new products to market and the infrastructure to, to do that. If it's a legacy bank, it'll enable them to concentrate on cloud migration if that's their thing or core system changes if that's what they need to do. So we will free them to focus on their knitting while we deliver rapidly at the front end to their customers and are capable of integrating into any environment. It's interesting. This is one of the themes. I have a couple of themes this year that I'm really trying to push forward in the banking transform world. And that is number one, at the very beginning, you're going to have to really transform your thinking and embrace the changes that's happening. You know, that, that a lot of organizations know what they need to do, maybe even know how to do it, but they're afraid to change because they've been doing it one way forever. They, they've been a branch-based organization or a non-branch organization for so long that moving in another direction is difficult. The other thing is the unbelievable importance of partnering with solution providers. As you mentioned, the solution providers out there today, 90% of them are really comfortable working with other solution providers to make the entire model work. They're not out there to dismantle another organization to move forward if it's going to create disruption in the organization that they're trying to serve. And overall, you know, I, th I think it's important that, yes, as an organization, you may think you have an idea as to how to transform your branches, but unless you work with an organization that really understands the back office of distribution, you're not going to get the benefits of all your case studies, all your previous experience, the way it's pivoted in the last 12 months. And why not take advantage of the mass of a number? You know, I, I talk about the GPS system where you say, you know, I want to avoid those, those roads that have high traffic. I want to avoid those roads that may have, you know, a rough road that, that I didn't expect. I want to find the cleanest, most efficient way to get to my destination with somebody who's going to understand what that destination looks like and can get me there. And I'm going to say this over and over again, probably faster and cheaper than you ever could have done yourself and with a better result. So, you know, again, it's so important to realize the benefit of not going it alone and realizing that, you know, the solution providers for the most part are not out there to beat up each other. The, the pie is rather big. It's really to see how can we get you to your promised land, whatever it is in your, your vision of your company, as well as possible. So let's do a little bit of a pivot here. Open banking is being embraced. You've mentioned open banking a couple of times. It's being embraced by a number of financial institutions leading to both financial and non-financial collaborations. What would greater adopting of adoption of open banking standards mean from a distribution standpoint. I mean, we're starting to see this. I know that uh, Emirates NBD has done a, a, a program as does uh, um, uh, Lacacia on a, a youth market and their distribution strategies are different. But, you know, does the partnerships that these organizations build kind of change the mix as far as how you want to distribute your services in conjunction with other organizations? Yeah, firstly, I'd like to say I love the GPS analogy, Jim. I like that a lot. So I think, yeah, in many cases, banks have seen openness as a challenge, as a problem, as a threat. But but some of the things we've spoken about already, shared branches, shared between banks, but, but also shared between complementary firms with different propositions, openness is the key to that. So, so uh, establishing physical, commercial and technical relationships with other services 
is clearly something which will make these branches more effective, easier to cost justify because they're going to generate more revenue. They're going to generate more loyalty. They're going to be hubs, not just for financial services, but potentially for a range of, of other services demanded by customers. And that will change over time. So it'll keep them fresh. It'll keep them relevant. It'll keep them compliant. Of course, here in Europe, the openness is, is by regulation. It's a, it's an absolute requirement. So. Uh, openness should be embraced rather than feared. It's the key to a more meaningful relationship with customers in the future, offering expanded services. And then banks will be able to determine and, and other branch deployers will be able to determine what are the best business models for them and their customers, what are the most profitable lines and so on. So I think it, it's really important that the banks embrace that. Well, it's interesting too, because as I've traveled to South America and to Africa and to other countries, we sometimes think so much within the bank model without realizing that in many countries, especially for the underserved consumer, there are new ways to distribute financial services using retailers, using other avenues where maybe accounts can be opened very seamlessly by using a retailer as your, your branch hub. Because really, overall, what we're trying to do from the very beginning of our discussion, what we're really trying to do is how do we embed banking within my daily life. So how do I make it so banking is everywhere I want it to be when I want it to be there, even when I don't want to go to a branch? Maybe I'm going to my convenience store. Maybe I go into my local retailer. And if there's a way to engage in banking there, it's another way of looking at distribution well beyond a traditional bank and a mobile device or a, a, a PC or a computer. Yeah, for absolute sure. You know, where, wherever historically there's been an ATM, there, there could be a lean branch, there could be an assisted service device, there could be access to a service. So that's in, in a mall, it's in the back of a store, it's in a, a village hall, it's in a civic civic um, office of some kind. So these things can be anywhere. We spoke about mobile, we spoke about pop-up. So absolutely, you, you know, you want to be able to in the future uh, access the service where wherever it makes most sense. You know, it, it doesn't follow that that the the old high street concept, the the main street yeah. concept, is the best place to put a bank in the future. There's more footfall, not through COVID, but generally in the past, there's been more footfall through shopping malls. Is that a better place to have yeah. uh, some kind of branch capability? So this these de technologies should be deployed wherever they're most required. The information, the data that they drive, because you know there's, there's information about the status of every device in real time. So we know about engineering. We know about the lowest cost of keeping 100% availability of equipment. We know about the movement of cash. And a large part of the cost of maintaining fleets like this is the, the movement of cash. We know about customer behavior. So we know where they go, how they transact and how often. And that means you can locate these services wherever they need to be. And when that changes, you move them on. Um, and as surely as, as the lean branch is smaller than a typical legacy bank branch, we're implementing technologies where a desk, um, a, a simple a docking station, and it can enable a full banking service in a contactless environment, in a cubicle, in a booth, anywhere that you choose it to be. Um, and, and that will be a way in which some people in future will choose to engage with financial services rather than taking the long journey to a branch or going online where maybe they have doubts about security or lack of competence in using the channel? Well, one thing's for sure. The way we distribute financial services will never be the same as it was in the past. In some cases, it's going to get broader. In some cases, it's going to get contracted. But for sure, organizations have to rethink distribution strategies in light of their real estate commitments, in light of their technology commitments, in light of how they're doing different channels, in light of the demographics of their customer base. Part of the personalization model is being able to provide services the way the consumer may want it. And by the way, demographic does not mean that older people want it this way, younger people want it this way. You know, one demographic income segment may want it this way. The reality is any assumption you make today is vastly different because across demographic groups, consumers are banking differently based on their experiences, especially over the last 12 months. So, Mark, finally, if an organization says we've got to do something, but we only can commit to right now one thing. What's that one thing? 
take a look at your legacy infrastructure, take a look at the way in which your channels, all of them, talk to your customer systems, the, the places, the core, where you hold all of your important information. And, and if that uh, infrastructure doesn't enable you to, to choose any way you wish, then it's wrong. When you've been listening to the same people for 20 years, telling you the same things about what's possible and what's not, maybe listen to another voice, yeah. open, open up a little bit, talk to others, listen to others. And please don't assume that a first in, first out approach is right for any kind of payments, any kind of banking services. The older the, the channel doesn't mean the less relevant the channel. The older the form of payment, it doesn't mean the less relevant. So will we see a cashless society? We'll see a less cash society. But I think we'll see a cardless society first. Will we see a branchless society? We'll see a less branch society. But I think we'll lose other channels before that, you know, mobile yeah. banking replacing online banking. So don't think first in, th first out. Listen to more voices. And if your infrastructure looks like it's the problem, then talk to somebody about changing it incrementally but rapidly. Well, it's, it's not an off on switch. It's pretty much a dimmer where you have to, it's a balancing, say, it's a big soundboard with all the different devices. So, Mark, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you or want to see what Origa provides, how do they do that? Because I know there's different websites based on some languages, but is it Origa, A U R I G A dot com, or is there a different way to get a hold of you? So it, because our headquarters is Italy, we, we have an SPA. It's the same as a PLC and LTD. It's the form of the business. So we're Origa Spa, A-U-R-I-G-A-S-P-A dot -A com. And then choose the English option. Unless, of course, you're a Spanish speaker, choose the Spanish <laughs> option. <laughs> Great to have you on the show today. And again, Mark, um, it, you know, really interesting topic and one that we all know is out there. But it, it's not a, as you said at the very beginning, it's not a, it's not an all branch. It's not an anti branch. It really is, and it, and it's not even a a delivery situation as much as a back office technology situation. That's one of the ways that Arika can help is not only bring in the experience of working with so many different financial institutions, but more importantly, understanding that it's legacy infrastructure that's got to be changed, and the processes have to be changed to make it simpler, no matter what channel a consumer wants. Thanks again, Mark. Appreciate you being on the show. Jim, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for your time. What a great interview with Mark Aldred from Origa. You know, when we talk about digital transformation, an aspect we talk about a lot is digital transformation. But digital transformation also includes physical structures, ATMs, cash machines, whatever it may be. It's around the whole distribution network. And as with many elements of digital transformation, it is the back office that's got to be fixed that will enable the front office to deliver. It's more than just shutting down branches. It's more than just making things digital. It's more than just humanizing the digital experience. It's making it the best for every single customer we serve. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform Solutions, our brand new extension, the Banking Transform podcast. If you enjoy today's interview, please be sure to follow the show on your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to give our show a five-star rating. Also, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and check out our research we are doing on digital transformation, retail banking innovation, the digital customer experience, financial marketing, and our brand new retail banking trends and priorities report that just got published. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Longbreak, audio engineer, Sean Roll Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Maroos. Until next time, embrace change, take risks, and disrupt yourself and your organization.